So thank you so much for taking the time to be here with me today, Dr. Frankovich. I really appreciate your time and your willingness to be interviewed. No problem. I appreciate your interest in your foundation forming to around this illness and autoimmune encephalitis. Thank you. So my first question is, there's been this distinction made between acute onset OCD associated with PANS versus uh, the more classic subacute onset of OCD. So I'm wondering if you think that a distinction can actually be made between immune-mediated OCD that's responsive to immunomodulatory treatments um, versus classic OCD based upon onset. Okay, so right now, we're still in the early stages of understanding this illness, and we are categorizing patients based on their presentation. So we don't know yet how different or similar patients with abrupt onset uh, OCD and how that differs from subacute onset OCD. Right now our clinic has formed around the entity of abrupt onset OCD. Um, and we are finding some interesting, you know, innate immune system and some adaptive immune system problems. We haven't, we are collecting samples on kids that have more of a subacute presentation. Um, and we, we haven't, you know, sort of analyzed those specimens yet. So we don't know how much they are related at this point in time. But as you know, there are some familial clustering uh, studies showing that there is a link between familial autoimmune disease and routine OCD or, or what is being categorized as OCD. So this may be on a spectrum. We just don't have the scientific data yet to, to, sh to show that. Right. So anecdotally, uh, allergies, heat, cold, stress, chemicals all seem to cause flares in some children with PANS. I'm wondering if this is consistent with your observations, um, and if so, what the underlying pathophysiology is and how you treat this a great question. So in terms of terminology, we use the term flare or relapse to characterize sort of a shift in the child's baseline. Um, but in terms of a lot of these kids after they have PANS, they may not go back down to their pre-PANS baseline, and they may have some residual OCD, anxiety, ADHD, and with those kids, definitely we see with stress and illness that they can have an increase in symptoms. Whether or not that increase in symptoms is an immunologic event or a psychological sort of response to stress, we don't know that. We're trying to collect samples to see if we see a signature in the immune system when there's an increase in symptoms. In terms of when kids have a full-blown relapse, so meaning they're at their new functioning level, and then all of a sudden they have a dramatic, profound change that lasts weeks. So that's what we call a relapse. And we do think those are and more of an immunologic response, and we are treating those kids with reintroduction of NSAIDs or maybe a steroid burst, um, and then also trying to identify an, um, an infection. So, so you know, to and so in the end, we don't know whether those minor upticks are immunologic, you know, from allergies or from stress, um, but you know, we're, we're still in the process of learning. How would you rank in terms of efficacy the various treatments such as steroids, antibiotics, steroids bearing agents, NSAIDs? So our approach is three-pronged um, in, and we really think they all work together, right? And so definitely we've learned our lesson in terms of giving steroids in the setting of a kid that still has an infection. And what we see is you see a temporary response and then they just, the steroids, the effect wears off and they, um, you know, are sick again. And sometimes that's because of, of the ongoing perhaps immune response, but sometimes it's because we missed like a tonsillar abscess or sinus infection or something. So we are very vigilant on making sure we treat what is um, a clear infection. Um, we don't go chasing 
titers for viruses. We don't chase down Lyme disease. We really just do a good physical exam and a good history to see if there is an infection that we can treat that's obvious to the clinician. So that is important. Um, in terms of the immune modulation, um, you know, if they're not getting better on NSAIDs or a steroid burst um, with the introduction of SSRI and CBT, um, then we might try, you know, a higher dose of steroids or a more prolonged dose of steroids. If the, ster if the kid is clearly responsive to steroids, but their symptoms creep back as we taper the steroids down, um, then we might consider a steroid sparing agent, but I would say that's the, the minority of children. Also, if we see a comorbid autoimmune disease, we treat that, or a comorbid arthritis, we treat that. But really, there's not like one therapy that we think is better than the others. Um, really, we think they all work well together. Um, and definitely like still doing the traditional psychiatric medicines, the SSRIs, the CBT, um, you know, when titrate is started at a low dose and titrated up, it can be extremely efficacious. So we still recommend the, the you know, standard of care for OCD and anxiety. Sure. And are there any plans to study the gut microbiome in PANS? So the University of Arizona has recently started an excellent PANS program, and they are doing microbiome studies. And the, the, I think the chair of pediatrics at the University of Arizona in Tucson is a very big microbiome researcher. So he is definitely poised to study that. Um, there is an Italian group that um, studied the microbiome and they did find um, some interesting differences in patients with new onset PANS pre-antibiotics. Um, so there is some thought that disruption of the microbiome may be playing a role. And do you believe that PANS is solely autoimmune in nature? So we are still, we're not, we don't know. Um, it's possible that PANS is like many inflammatory diseases where it might start off as an innate immune event, innate immune system, meaning our more primitive immune system. Um, and then over time, maybe with repeated relapses or more prolonged sort of episodes, then it might be invoking uh, adaptive um, immune mechanisms. So the adaptive immune system is our memory immune system, the T cells and the B cells. Um, so diseases like lupus actually involve both arms of the immune system. Diseases like autoimmune thyroiditis, type 1 diabetes, celiac disease, really there's been, you know, maybe the early stages were innate, we don't know, because we capture those diseases when they have the true autoimmune antibody response. So the reason why we're not sure in PANS is really PANS is presenting very early in the disease course. So it's not like type 1 diabetes where um, the patient may have the inflammatory disease for a long time before they actually lose enough islet cells to have the hypoglyph, to have the diabetes picture, right? In PANS, we're probably seeing the kids very early in the disease course. Um, so it's, so that's where I'm saying it's like, it depends on the disease phase. Definitely we've seen kids have um, many relapses or chronic disease, and then they have other you know, autoimmune diseases like celiac disease, thyroiditis, type 1 diabetes, and they have um, a lot of autoantibodies and they have low complements. And in those kids, we do think it's, it's at that point, it's autoimmune. So there's been talk lately about scrapping the terms PANS and PANDAS and instead using autoimmune encephalitis to describe both PANS and PANDAS. Do you think it's accurate to characterize all PANS and PANDAS as autoimmune encephalitis? Well, it depends if you're a lump or a splitter, right? Um, I think um, that there's this more overarching term that we should be using, is, which is inflammatory brain disease, right? So you're not pinning it on autoimmune mechanisms or innate mechanisms because we don't know. We don't have biopsy data. We can't possibly know. Um, so by calling it inflammatory brain disease, we stay more broad. And within that umbrella, there's a lot of different inflammatory brain diseases, right? Multiple sclerosis is an inflammatory brain disease, but it's not autoimmune encephalitis. Um, CNS vasculitis is an, is an inflammatory disorder, but it's not autoimmune encephalitis. I think it is important in 
science and research and medicine to keep your disease groups well defined because you're more likely to understand the mechanism. If we lump these kids with abrupt onset OCD and a relapsing and remitting pattern in with kids with presentations more like an MDA receptor encephalitis, I think that if all those kids are grouped together, we may not understand the mechanisms because there may be different mechanisms. So at this point, I think it's more important to still study these kids that all present similarly as a, an entity. And whether you call it PAMS or PANDAS or you call it abrupt onset OCD with, you know, sort of immune derangement, and it doesn't matter what you call it as long as you study it as an isolated sort of illness. And then once you understand the mechanisms, you can start branching out and looking at these other subgroups and seeing how they're related. Excellent, thank you. And do you think that intracellular strep might play a role in children who have difficult to treat pans and pandas or ongoing symptoms? That is a great question. We do not know. Um, I think that um, is a good question for research and for the people who are strep experts, um, but something that we definitely are interested in researching. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Frankovich. This is really helpful, and I'm really grateful that you took the time to share your expertise with us today. Thank you. Take care.